Hello and welcome to C6 Church Online. We are excited for all of you joining us online today. We particularly want to welcome our guests who are online. Thank you for being a part of this service. We pray that it is a meaningful time for you. Our physical gatherings as a church are at 10.30 a.m. on Sundays. We meet at the Boys and Girls Club facility at Empower Campus. It is the former school for the deaf. The address is 2001 East 8th Street here in Sioux Falls. We are taking precautions to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. We will continue to make our teachings available online on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. so that those who can't be in church can watch online. Please let us know you were a part of this service by filling out our online connection card or sending an email to hello at c6church.com. We'll be glad to know you are here. Growth groups will be starting in the week of September 20th. Please endeavor to join a group. We'll soon give you the details of the location and time. Our shoe drive for Nigeria is going well. Our goal is 1,000 shoes and we have collected 72 shoes. You can make a financial donation to get shoes if you so desire. You can also drop off a donation of shoes at our church office or bring them to church on Sunday morning. Once more, thank you for your generosity to C6 and to the Lord. Here's what Jesus said in Luke 6, 38. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. We pray the Lord continually blesses your generosity. You can give by simply going online to c6church.com or texting the word GIVE to 605-468-C6C6 or 2626. It is our new number. You can also mail a check to C6 Church, 2601 South Minnesota Avenue, Suite 105, PMB 360, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57105. Relax and enjoy the service as I turn it over to Pastor Zach. Hi, my name is Zach Ochoga, and I'm the pastor, the lead pastor of C6 Church here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I want to welcome you to our service online today. I want to thank you for taking out the time to be a part of the service today, particularly those of you who are our guests, who are here with us for the first time, or our guests in one way or the other. Thank you so much for being a part of this service and this teaching today we've been in a series titled generosity giver forward slash taker or giver or taker and today is the third part of that series before we dive into the series would you join me in a word of prayer father in heaven thank you so much for this opportunity to speak on your behalf i ask that this would be a meaningful moment for each person In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, Generosity, giver, or taker. Today I want to speak on what I titled, Recognize God's Generosity. Recognize God's Generosity. One of the things that impacts or influences the choices that we make in life and even our behaviors is the mentality and mindset of scarcity. So the concept and mindset of scarcity has a way of influencing our choices and our behavior. The mindset of scarcity and poverty can be very paralyzing. When you believe that food is scarce, what happens is you have the tendency to overeat or to hoard food whenever you have food. It reminds me when I first moved to the States, lived with my parents-in-law. Holly and I lived with her parents for a while before we got settled. I ate a lot of meat. <laughs> I ate a lot of meat, a lot of beef. Oh, my goodness. I think that in a few months... I ate more beef than I ate probably in a year or two back in Nigeria because a distinction between uh, meals here and back in Nigeria is that we define our meals by the carbohydrate. The, that, 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 that would be 
what we would use to describe our meal. So, for example, if we had rice and beef, what we would say would be we, we were eating rice and beef was like a side. But here in the States, food is described by the protein. So you're eating steak or whatever form of beef and rice is the side. So I ate a lot. I ate a lot of meat, a lot of beef. And, and I think that part of what played into it was a subconscious uh, mentality of the scarcity of meat. And so when I had meat of mine, I just gave it a go. You know, I ate to my full. And as I ate a lot of meat, I also grew bigger. <laughs> my waistline expanded. And I had to do something about that. I had to intentionally shift. I had to intentionally shift my mindset so that I wouldn't have to eat as much as I was eating and not as frequently as I was eating, eating meat or beef, whatever it was. Something that helped me, something that helped me with not eating as much as I ate was the knowledge, the conscious knowledge that there was an abundance of meat. I could eat any kind of meat any time I wanted, you know, any day I wanted. And so I didn't have to eat as much as I ate in a given t- at a given moment. It is, it is interesting how that plays in our minds. And you might, be, you might go like, well, I don't know if I've experienced that. We, almost all of us experience it in one area of our lives or the other. I've just given an example with meat, with protein. And yours might be with finances or might be with time or might be with relationships, you know, whatever it is. When you have a scarcity mindset and a poverty mindset, it affects your generosity. In the book titled Scarcity, Mulanathan, Mula Nathan is his name, one of the authors, and Sendil wrote a book titled Scarcity. And, and, and in one of the chapters, this is what they said. They said, in the, 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 the researched scarcity, the science of scarcity, the science and psychology of scarcity. Now, in one of the chapters, they said, when we think of the poor, we naturally think of a shortage of money. When we think of the busy or the lonely, we think of a shortage of time or of friends. But our results suggest that scarcity of all varieties also leads to a shortage of bandwidth. Now, when they say bandwidth, according to this book, the definition of bandwidth had to do with, with the mental capacity to make choices and decisions. The mental capacity to make choices and decisions, decisions is what they refer to here as bandwidth. And because bandwidth affects all aspects of behavior, this shortage has consequences. So, scarcity leads to a shortage of bandwidth, which is your mental capacity to make choices of, or decisions. It, there's a shortage in that area as well, as a result of a, of, of a context of scarcity. And having a shortage of bandwidth which is the mental capacity to make choices and decisions, there are further consequences that follow. And they give examples of some of those consequences. One is that you face challenges of sticking to a plan. So someone with a mindset, a mentality of, 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 of scarcity and within a context of scarcity is likely going to face um, challenges of sticking to a plan as a result of a shortage in the person's mental capacity to make choices and decisions. Another consequence is the inability to resist temptation. That is also a consequence that results from having a shortage in the mental capacity to make choices and decisions, which flows from a mindset of scarcity or a context of scarcity. Forgetfulness is another one. Cognitive slips is another consequence of a shortage of bandwidth or the mental capacity to make choices and decisions. 
So cognitive, cognitive slips like uh, the misestimation of your bank statement, for example, uh, were some of the things that they found, or the mishandling of invitations. Scarcity also, they found, perpetuates scarcity. And as a result of that, scarcity creates its own trap. So when someone is within the context of scarcity and has a mindset of scarcity, the likelihood is that you are trapped in scarcity. Because one thing after the other plays out and you remain in scarcity. Now, a scarcity of or a poverty mindset hinders generosity. This is what I'm trying to get at. The big idea for this teaching is that you can be generous. You can be generous because you are wealthy in Christ. You can be generous because you are wealthy in Christ. Now we're going to read um, a passage in 2 Corinthians, a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, you know, uh, touching on generosity. You know, some people think that generosity is about how much you have or you don't have. Generosity really is not about how much you have or you don't have. Generosity is a function of the heart. And I'm going to show you this. 2 Corinthians 8, we're going to read verses 7 through 14. Since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, you, you, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I am not commanding you to do this, but I'm testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Here's my advice. It will be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give. And you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course. I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. So my first encouragement to you or my big encouragement to you in today's teaching is to overcome the hindrance to generosity overcome the hindrance to generosity as a matter of fact any hindrance overcome any hindrance to generosity it is God's will for you to be generous generosity you know makes you look like God because God is a generous God and if there's anything that stops you from being generous overcome that hindrance and Paul in the passage that we just read shares some principles to help with overcoming the hindrances to generosity I'm going to run through a few uh, quickly but there will be one that I'm going to dwell on a little bit longer than the others so what are some of these principles that can help you overcome generosity to give you a quick background before I go into the principles Paul had mentioned that the church at Corinth were the first who wanted to give. In fact, they had even started. But somewhere along the line, they stopped. Somewhere along the line, they developed cold feet. They lost their enthusiasm and zeal and eagerness to be generous. And so Paul needed to motivate them and help them jump the hurdle. Help them overcome the hurdles that were in their way and stopping them from being generous. And so he shares a number of principles to help them overcome the hurdles 
that were in their way to being generous. The first is this. Make it a goal to excel in giving. Make it a goal to excel in giving. Paul says, hey, you guys, you are, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7, he says, since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. So you're gifted in so many ways. And you have strived, you have set it, made it a goal to excel in those ways. Now what I want you to do is to make it a goal to excel in giving as well. So think about areas of your life that you're excellent at. I'm sure you've been intentional about it. You've applied yourself, applied energy, applied thought, applied, you know, your, 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 yourself to advance in that area. And Paul is saying, okay, now I want you to do the same with giving. You know, sometimes I, 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 I find myself being negligent in the area of giving. I find myself being negligent in the area of giving sometimes, not giving it the kind of thought that I'll give to other things that I do. And Paul is saying here, no, make it a goal to excel in giving. And there are a few things that can really help you excel at giving. And I'm going to talk about that principle um, in the next uh, part of this series, the fourth part of this series. So make it a goal. Make it a goal to excel in giving. Have you made it a goal? Do you just uh, come to church and whatever you find in your wallet you give or you don't even plan it, you come to church and you don't even give any offering? Or do you um, just give people gifts whenever they ask for it? Or d are you intentional? Do you plan? Do you have a goal of what you want to achieve in the area of your generosity? Is there a set amount that you would want to see yourself give out? You know, these are all things that come to play in making generosity a goal. The second way that you can overcome hindrances to generosity is be generous out of love. Let it flow out of love. Paul could have commanded them and said, hey, you guys, you got to give. I want to see you put to bring together money now and let's take it to the church at Jerusalem. But here's what he says in verse 8. I am not commanding you to do this, but I'm testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. So generosity is a proof of love. It's a proof of love. Let it flow from love. Let your generosity flow from a heart of love and not because somebody compelled you to give. The third thing that he mentions here as a way of overcoming hindrances to generosity is to give within your means. Give within your means. I remember, you know, as a young teenager, I was, you know, burning for the Lord, on fire for the Lord, so passionate for the Lord. And um, I remember a, ch a church that we we're a part of, and they were taking pledges, and, 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 I, and I pledged what I did not have. I did not have the ability to make that kind of money, and I pledged, and I pledged it. And, you know, growing older and uh, learning the Bible more, I'm like, oh, how foolish that was. I was trying to give what I did not have. I was trying to give beyond my means. I had no means of income. I was just a young teenager. And yet here I was, you know, making that kind of pledge. And Paul, if I understood this then, I would have not done it. Paul says, no, give within your means. This is so beautiful. So let's imagine your income is just $500 a month. And there's somebody else who's, whose income uh, in a month is $5,000. Here's what God says. Give within your means. This is beautiful. Give within your means. It means the person with $5 or $500 or $5,000 as an income, all can give. They just need to give within their means. Give within your means. And then it helps you overcome the hindrance to generosity because when you just look at how much you have you would not want to give but when you understand the principle that no i'm supposed to give within the means my means within what i have it helps you 
The next principle to help you overcome uh, hindrances to generosity is to give wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 12. It says, whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. You want to be able to give cheerfully. You want your heart to be in your giving. And so he encourages you to give wholeheartedly. The next principle that would help you overcome hindrances to generosity is let your abundance flow to others in need. Abundance simply means having more than enough. It's a difficult thing sometimes to determine if you have more than enough or not. And so because you have the Spirit of God in you, that helps you to determine uh, this is more, whether this is more than enough or not. Your understanding of scriptures, your, 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 the, the, the economy within which you, you live, the, the Spirit of God in your heart would help you determine if you have more than enough or not. So, when God blesses you with more than enough, let it flow to others. In 2 Corinthians 8, 13, 14, of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. So what Paul is saying here is, uh, there are times and seasons in life that God blesses you with abundance. And there are times and seasons that he may not bless you with such abundance. And Paul is saying, when you are having abundance, share your abundance with others who are in need. And then when they are in abundance and you are in need, they can share with you in your time, in your time of need. So, Let's imagine, I want to use this example simply because we're even doing a shoe drive right now. Let's imagine you have 20 pairs of shoes. 20 pairs of shoes. Is that more than enough or not? Is there somebody else who would be so glad and thankful to God that you blessed him or her with some of your shoes? So I, I want to encourage you. Think about areas of your life. Some people have clothes, and just maybe you are one of those people. You have clothes that you have even never used, and yet it's been lying there for close to a year. Is there somebody who needs that that you can bless the person with? So let your abundance flow to others in need. You have food that even gets spoiled, you know, while there are other people who need it. Could it be that it's time for you to go through your pantry and figure out the things that are close to getting expired? Maybe there's a month on it. There are people who would be so happy to receive them from you and they'll consume them right away because they need them and they'll be thankful to God. Let your abundance flow to others in need. How else can you overcome the hindrance or hindrances to generosity? And this is the big one I want to talk about. Understand that you are wealthy because of Christ's generosity towards you or toward you. Understand that you are wealthy because of Christ's generosity towards you. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. This raises a few questions. This passage, this verse that we just read, raises a few questions, and I want to answer them. The first is, when was Jesus rich? And we'll look at John 17 and verse 5. John 17 verse 5 says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The message says, And now, Father, glorify me with your very own splendor, the very splendor I had in your presence before there was a world. So Jesus, pre-incarnate pre Jesus, Jesus was with the Father 
before he took on human flesh and came into the world. And he had all the wealth you can think of that you cannot even think of, as a matter of fact. You know, he shared all the wealth that God the Father had. So at that time, he was rich. He was wealthy. And so this is what Paul is saying. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, and that was the time that he was rich. So this leads us to the second question. When and how did Jesus become poor? When and how did Jesus become poor? Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. And I'm reading from the message. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. So when and how did Jesus become poor? Je from this passage that we've just looked at, Jesus became poor upon entry into the human race. He, he was equal to God, shared the status of God, had all the wealth and riches of God, so to speak. But he put all of that aside, all his privileges, all his wealth and riches, he put that aside and took on human flesh, came into humanity through the virgin birth and that was poverty that was poverty you know poverty is a relative term when i interact with people here who are homeless or who are below the poverty line i tell them that they're actually wealthy and so they go like what are you talking about i'm like yes you are i, I was speaking with some homeless people and uh, they wanted me to help them, you know, they wanted me to help them with, uh, to pay for a motel. And I said, hey, go to a shelter. There are many shelters here. And I listed, g give them all the options. And they didn't want to go there for some reason. Okay, they gave me their reasons for not going there. And I said, hey, where I come from, we don't have shelters. We don't have shelters. You guys have shelters here where you can go to and, s and live there, you know, for probably as long as you need to while you hustle to get back on your feet. So do you see in one part of the world, there are, not, there are not even any shelters. In this part of the world, they have shelters. Now, I was talking with some people who are below the poverty line, and I tell them, I say, hey, you guys are living in apartments, and yet you're considered to be below the poverty line. Oh, my goodness. You guys have heat. You have water flowing into your, into, into, you, into, your, into your bathroom, into your, into your kitchen. I'm like, go to other parts of the world. Even people who are considered to be well-to-do in some of those parts of the world do not have the luxury of having water flow into their bathrooms and flow into their kitchens regularly. I said, you have a fridge. I said, you even have something called a washing machine. So you don't need to wash clothes with your hands. You put the pile of clothes into this machine and this thing washes your clothes? Oh my goodness. And then you put it into another and it dries your clothes. You even have something called a dishwasher. I'm like, whoa. You know, but within the United States, I want you to get this right. Within the United States and this economy, they are considered poor. Compared to the vast majority of people on the planet Earth, they are wealthy. So, so wealth and poverty are relative, are relative. Now for Jesus, leaving glory and where he was with God the Father and coming into humanity, that was poverty. And even as a human, Jesus was not amongst the wealthy people or the wealthiest people. So that was 
poverty on another level. Jesus became poor simply by coming into humanity, not to talk about his day-to-day life, of not owning a house and things like that. Now, the question, it leads us to the third question, how do we become rich then through his poverty? 2 Corinthians 5.21, and this is still the message. In Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so we could be put right with God. So, how do we become rich through the poverty of Jesus Christ? Jesus became poor for us. In other words, it was substitutionary. He took our place. He took our place so that we don't have to be poor. So in Jesus Christ, every wrong that was on us, in us, was put on Jesus so that we would be right with God. Romans 8 and verse 32, the message. If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? So this is how God makes us rich. This is how Jesus makes us rich through his poverty. So he came into earth as a human, was poor compared to where he was in glory, and he sacrificed his very own life for us. And because of that, there is nothing God would withhold from us as a loving father because he had already given us his best and that was Jesus Christ. This is how we become rich through Christ. So because of what Christ has done for me, because of what the father has done through Christ for me, I can be confident that he would provide me with everything I need. Not just here, but I have more in eternity with him. This is how Jesus Christ has made me wealthy through his poverty. So, a picture, I, I, you know, I thought about a picture. What would be a picture to just show you, you know, that wealth in Jesus Christ is not just about money. You know, some people think that, oh, so when you talk about uh, he becoming rich as a result of Christ's poverty, that it's all about just money. No, it's not all about money. Now, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 6, you know, but Peter said, I have no silver and gold. This is Peter speaking to the beggar by the gate. I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So he he didn't have money. He was not rich in terms of money, but he was rich in terms of something else. The power of God at work in and through his life to be a blessing to someone else. That is part of the riches that we have been blessed with in Christ Jesus. So friends, One of the big obstacles towards being generous is having a mindset, a mentality of scarcity and poverty. Paul understood this. Perhaps it was one of the reasons why the church in Corinth, you know, slowed down and were not being as generous as they initially desired to be. Because when you begin to think of how uncertain the times are and how little you have and, you know, not knowing how much or how long it will last you, you would not be generous. And so Paul tries to get them to understand, hey, deep in your heart, you need to understand that you are wealthy. You need to understand that because of Jesus Christ, you have become rich. Because of Jesus Christ, you have become rich. So your focus is no longer on the limited resources you have. Your focus is now on the supplier of resources in your life, who is Christ. And because Jesus meets your needs and supplies all your needs according to his riches 
in glory, you can afford to be generous with what you have, no matter how little it is. As a follower of Christ, if you're going to give, it will always have to be from a place of abundance. Not abundance in terms of what you have in your pocket or in your bank account or in your house, but abundance in terms of what you have in Christ. This is why economically, when a person is poor and a follower of Christ, the person could still be generous because... The person is giving from a place of abundance in Jesus Christ and not the economy of the world. When the heart is afraid of scarcity, it paralyzes its ability to be generous. And I can tell you in my life, many times when I'm afraid about, okay, when would I get my next income? When would I get money next? Or when would I have food next or when would i be able to purchase you know clothes next it it freezes me and i'm i'm not generous i don't release what i have but i can tell you there was a time in my life that i was impressed of the lord to give out all my clothes and i went home and i gathered all my clothes except a pair of clothes and i gave all of it out as gifts to people in the church I was pastoring at that time. The reason why I could be confident to give out everything I had in terms of clothing, even though I was not sure where I would get clothing from next, was because I saw myself having abundance in Jesus Christ and that Jesus would supply me with my needs. He would supply me with my needs. I could, you know, even if he did not provide me with more clothes, you know, I would still be happy to give because I was, I was content and happy with the last pair I had, you know, after I had given out all of those clothes. So if, it is, if you are going to ever overcome the hindrances to generosity, one key thing that we must overcome is a heart thing, and that is the mindset of poverty, the mindset of scarcity. Research, just like I referred to at the beginning of this message, shows that there's this psychology, the science and psychology of scarcity. And when, when people have a mindset, they're in a context of poverty and scarcity and have a mindset of scarcity, what happens is it perpetuates itself. And then it's a trap. But through Jesus Christ, you and I, no matter how little we have, do not have to be in the trap of scarcity because our confidence is not in the economy of the United States or the economy of the world. Our confidence is in Jesus Christ and the economy of heaven. So I want to I end on this note. You are rich in Christ. And I want to Read you two passages of scriptures quickly in, in, in closing and as an encouragement. Romans 10 and verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. You are rich. You are rich in Jesus Christ. He bestows his riches on you because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Hey, and I'm, I, I am assuming that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, I'll talk to you here in a little bit. And in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You've been blessed. Now think about this. If you wake up each day, whether you're whether you're able to have breakfast or not, have your meal for that day or not, or have your, uh, you know, the money you need for that day or not, if you're able to wake up each day and say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your blessings in my life. I thank you for your provision in my life. Guess what? You'll be shifting. You'll be shifting from a mindset of scarcity to, to a mindset of abundance in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to be thankful and grateful to God 
for his blessings in your life because that would be a key act of faith for you to overcome the mentality of scarcity and poverty. God has been generous to you. Recognize that generosity. His generosity to you is through Jesus Christ. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, friends, he is generous to you just like he's generous to everybody else. Jesus says, the Father causes the sun to shine both on the wicked and the righteous, the rain to fall on the wicked and the righteous. He's generous to everybody in that sense. But there's a generosity that separates those that put their faith in Jesus Christ from those that don't. Because you are, you are into a personal relationship with God, he guarantees you because of your faith in Jesus Christ that you'll be in eternity with him. And he has so many promises that he makes to those who place their faith in him. So I want to encourage you, if you've not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ, to put your faith in Jesus Christ and accept this generosity of God that does not just come to everybody, but specially comes to those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. God wants you to be generous. He wants you to be generous because you're like him when you're generous. There are so many reasons he wants you to be generous. And if there's something that keeps holding you back, this is the key that will help you overcome it. I imagine that when you overcome every hindrance to generosity in your life, that you'll be a blessing to others. Your life will be such a life of blessing. People c would not be able to help but to thank God for you. I'm going to say a word of prayer here, and we'll close. If you're listening today and you call C6 Church your home, at the bottom of the screen are the options for giving. But if you're a guest, we're not asking you to give. This is our gift to you. This teaching is our gift to you because we want to be a giving church and not just a church that receives from you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the time um, we've had together. I ask your blessing on everyone, Lord. I pray especially for those who have not yet put their faith in you, Lord Jesus, that you help them put their faith in you to enjoy the generosity that comes from you. Help us and help each person under the sound of my voice overcome every hindrance to generosity in their lives. Help us be the blessing that you've created us to be. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. See you next week. Bye.